Hey everybody, welcome back to Heroes of Sport. My name is Bob Babbitt and I'm co-founder of the Challenge Athletes Foundation. Our next guest, he's 2018 Paralympian. Mr. Thomas Walsh joins us from his palatial estate in Vail, Colorado. Thomas, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. So growing up in Vail, I don't think you had much of an option but to be, become a skier. That is correct. Uh, I was born into a town here in Vail, surrounded by mountains, surrounded by outdoors activities. We had snow all winter, and it's just naturally where I ended up. And so was your early on, was skiing it? Was that your sport, or did you play a bunch of sports? So I was born in Vail, and I grew up playing a plethora of sports. I was involved in all those junior things like soccer and lacrosse and hockey and baseball and all that stuff. I really enjoyed doing biking, triathlons, running. Uh, we have such a great environment to do that in, so I really enjoyed that growing up. But on the other side, I also was involved in a lot of arts. I was in my first musical when I was very young. I actively participated in various types of dance, like ballet, tap, and jazz, uh, and musical theater. So I really also loved that. And then as I got older, I started to focus in a little bit more on skiing and really dedicated my life to that track. So the cool thing is how everything works together as a skier, all the, the dance and everything else you were taking obviously made you better at, at skiing and your skiing obviously helped everything from that side as well. When you were 14 or so, is that when you realized there was something going on with your leg? Yes, sir. I grew up doing those various activities all in support of skiing. And when I get, got to that age around 14, I decided that this is what I want to do. I'd always have dreams of becoming a professional skier and racing in the Olympics and stuff, but that's a little too young to decide that. So once I made that choice, I was going to go away to a ski academy and really become a skier. But unfortunately, the day before I was supposed to go to boarding school, I was diagnosed with cancer in my pelvis and in my lungs. Yeah, and you had, what, over 12 surgeries during that period of time? To be honest with you, I, I think it's a little bit more than 12. I kind of lost track. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know you've had a lot of surgeries when you don't remember exactly how many you've had. It was metastatic Ewing's sar sarcoma. And what were they telling you? Because it's when I look, look it up, it seems like the pretty low chance of survival when somebody ha is diagnosed with that. It is a very aggressive type of cancer. Uh, all sarcomas are. And, you know, all cancers are for that matter. But uh, I, I was pretty far down the path in my illness and I was very sick. And so the outcomes were not looking too great. So I was treated with various surgeries, a pelvic resection, as well as bilateral thoracotomies to my lungs. And then I also received countless rounds of chemotherapy. And I did also receive radiation to my lungs. And as a young man who was hoping to be a professional skier, what was the lowest point for you? How tough was this for you to deal with? I think it's really hard for me personally to pinpoint that moment. As, mm -hmm. as all people going through great challenges uh, or struggles or, or cancer, specifically in my instance, the whole, the whole experience is not really positive. Um, I was really young. Uh, I was... Yeah young but not young enough not to remember so i was kind of caught in that that middle ground where i was 14 and i, I knew what was happening i knew why i was getting chemo I, I i was able to really kind of i wasn't really able to i was forced to understand you know the idea of mortality and fate and so looking back on it, i think the hardest part was was having to to grow up really quickly and, and yeah, kind of losing a little bit of that innocence of youth. Right. You're, you're sort of forced to deal with real life problems as a kid where, you know, you're not supposed to be dealing with life threatening health issues when you're 14 years old. You're supposed to be playing baseball, basketball and skiing, period. Correct. <laughs> so uh, when it, it, did they talk about possibly amputating your leg? Yeah, you had a, they had to go in and, and do a lot of surgery on what long pelvis. Talk a little bit about what was, what, what you ended up losing, what part of your bodies were, were removed. So my primary tumor was located in my right pelvis. Yeah. And I had secondary nodules in my, both of my lungs. 
And so this type of cancer is usually found in elongated bones, such as, you know, your shin or your femur or something like that. Mine was in my pelvis. And it was as I was growing up and developing. So I was treated with chemotherapy. And then that was used to reduce the size of the tumors. And then they went in and they removed specifically the right side of my pelvis, some parts of my um, super ramus, my super pubis, and a little bit of my acetabulum. So that is quote unquote where my pelvic amputation comes from. And then they did go into both of my lungs and cut out some nodules. Um, So I have all my natural limbs. However, I have lymphedema in my right leg as a byproduct of that pelvic amputation. So growing up in Vail and growing up in a skiing community, you were aware of adaptive skiers, right? You had seen people on mono skis probably from when you were a little kid. Did you think that you could ski in Paralympics or, or when did that become a reality for you? After my cancer treatment, I decided to go back to skiing as an able-bodied athlete. I competed in junior races uh, at a ski academy that I attended. And it was wonderful. I did it because I wanted to prove to myself that I was able to get back to my sport. And then I took a little break, transitioned my life out of the sport into some art in college. And then I learned that I was able to be classified as a disabled athlete. And that's when I really gave the Paralympic team and Paralympics a look because I wasn't quite sure that I would be classifiable. Right. I am so glad that I am because the community and the team and the people and all that I've learned, you know, through Paralympics and being involved with CAF have helped me uh, feel more welcome and be more proud of how, who I am and what I look like today. And growing up, you're close friends with Michaela Schifrin, one of the most decorated alpine skiers in history. Uh, talk a little bit about going over in 2014, I think it was, you went over to Sochi to watch the Olympics. And obviously, Michaela skied very well there. Was that, how important was that for you to be back in the sea skiing at the top level? After I was finished with high school, I yeah. decided to go to an art school and pursue theater. Yes. Which had been another part of my life growing mm-hmm. up. And so once I went to Sochi with my Make-A-Wish to watch uh, some of the the events and watch my friend compete, I felt that that skiing bug was still in me. It hadn't gone anywhere. (laughs) It was just in there. And I knew that I could do it. And it's such a huge part of my life. And I think sport is such a pure medicine to anybody who's overcoming something. And seeing an athlete at the top of their game in, in whatever that may be, truly inspired me to say, you know what, despite this limitation, despite my, my new disability, I'm going to go out there and give it my best. So you joined the Paralympic team, I think 2015. And if I'm not mistaken, you won your first race in St. Moritz. Correct. <laughs> How cool was that? First race, you win. So I, I, I was very lucky in my my debut season, I came in very, very strong. Uh, my eyes are wide open. I'm ready to go. And in my first season, I was very fortunate to finish third in my first race in Slovenia. And then I earned two additional gold medals that season in Switzerland and in Aspen. And that really gave me a thirst for the competitive edge in our sport. And so 19 event podiums. Something like that? I believe so. More than that now. I I like to measure my success in the happiness the sport gives me. I enjoy the medals. I enjoy the globe. I enjoy all that I succeed with. But at the end of the day, for me, if I had a good run and I had fun doing it and I did my best, that's all I can count on. So 2018, you go to your first Paralympic Games. What was that experience like? To me, it is amazing how big and how intense the Paralympics are. Yeah. They can teach you how to prepare for it. And we work on it every day with our mental coaches and, and, and stuff, but you don't really see how big it is until you get there. And so during, you're gearing up for the, 20, uh, the, the 2020 games, right? Or 2021 games. And next thing you know, the, um, 
uh, with COVID and everything, how did you change uh, in terms of your preparation? It sounds like you had a little hip surgery during this time off. Correct. So I am currently preparing for the 2022 Beijing Games. Yes. And I, I unfortunately sustained an injury in the beginning of last season on my non-cancerous hip. However, I was very fortunate at the time because the majority of our major competitions were canceled. Right. So it was, it was a perfect time for me to get that taken care of, recover fully, take the steps to be as strong as possible. And now I'm back to training full time. I'm going to be going to, to be on some snow and really get those repetitions up in my sport. And I'll be ready to go full gas come uh, next March. Okay. And I don't think people understand this part. How fast have you gone skiing? How fast have I gone? I will say that I believe I've gone faster than I have, but when they use this, the speed trap on us, the maximum speed we'll really be going is around 65 miles an hour. <laughs> and it's like sticking, miles your, an hour. sticking your head out the window and just shaking and going as fast as you can. Oh my God. So when you're going out and checking out a course, and like pre-walking it. I mean, you're going 65 miles an hour. There's no time to react. I mean, you have to know that course, like every inch of it. How much time do you spend preparing for each run? So for each run, we get an inspection. Okay. And, and what we'll do is we'll slip down the entire course and we'll look at the snow. We'll look at the turns. We'll put our bodies in a position where we want to see where we're going to go. Yeah. Another important part of our sport is the variables. Uh, the snow changes throughout the day. The snow could be much better or much worse, depending on where you start. Because someone who's bib number three, the snow is going to be much different than someone who's bib number 63. Yes. Yeah. So in inspecting that, you have to take that into mind. And the big part of our training, as in any sport, is that muscle memory. We practice for this. We, we know what kind of snow to look for. We know what kind of line to look for, what body to go for. And what we're actively doing is at the start gate, talking to our coaches who are on the course, we're like, Hey, how's this gate looking? And we have to have that trust and that relationship for them to give us the information to help us succeed when we come there, because we don't know what it looks like now. When I look at it, I always go, Oh my God, it's you know, the fog moves in. It's snowing. What wax are you using? I mean, there's so many intangibles that you guys are dealing with and you're talking about, a, a spot on the Paralympic team and a, a Paralympic gold medal. I mean, there's a lot at stake. Uh, figuring out the wax and all that. Huh? You've grown up with it, but I'm guessing it's still a little bit of a, of a guess when you get out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I really love about skiing is that there are so many variables. Yeah. There are so many things that, that could happen or could go wrong or could go great. Um, the weather, you can't control the weather the wax you can do your best to wax your skis to help them go faster on the snow but the sun could come out and then your wax could be slow so what's truly remarkable is we have all these different variables and it comes down to thousands of a second you know hundreds yes. of a second who 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 went faster by 100 that that will make or break a winning run what's the relationship like with the other skiers because the reality is you can't control how fast somebody else goes it's sort of you against you and you against the course. But at the same time, you're trying to finish in front of the other guy. Is there a camaraderie there among the athletes knowing that, hey, they can't control what you do. You're, you're in charge of you. So sometimes that makes it so, listen, we're, we're all out here together. We're all competing against the course. We can be buddies. Uh, but on, you know, when we get on the slopes, I want to I beat you. Absolutely. And in response to that, there's kind of there's kind of two facets to that question. Yeah. We think of it as... Ski racing is an individual sport. However, we train and travel and support each other in a team mentality. Yeah. So each country for, from our national team, I travel with the same people and we support each other and we help each other get faster. However, at the end of the day, I'm only competing for myself. Yeah. And then on the other end, there's that community for the entire you know population of para-alpine skiers. And... I'm fortunate enough to have been able to see both sides of this from the able-bodied side growing up as a junior elite athlete and yeah. now as a Paralympic athlete and seeing on the Paralympic side is it, it 
I, I really don't love the word inspiring, but it really helped me, you know, see past that competitive edge. At the end of the day, yes, we all want to beat each other, but you always see Paralympic athletes at the finish line cheering each other on, watching each other. Yes, we yeah. get competitive. Yes, there's drama. Yes, there are rivalries. However, I feel that no matter what happens, we're all sitting there making sure each other doesn't get injured and we all want each other to succeed. How important has CAF been in this journey of yours? CAF has been immensely helpful. Ski racing is not a cheap sport. Yeah. And as I started, you know, skiing again, there's no way I could afford to be doing what I'm doing and chasing my dreams and representing our country and standing up for all people with impairments. And so being a CAF athlete has helped me financially and emotionally be a part of a team and a community and, and, and live my life to the fullest that I know I can. In terms of training, what, what's a typical day for you in terms of the type of training you do? And it has that changed. It's funny. I look at you, you're, you're still a very young man, but has your training changed a lot from when you were, you know, when you, before you lost, before you were, uh, had to have your surgeries and going through chemo, has the training changed a lot from the, the person before the, before cancer and the guy after cancer? So before my cancer, I was young, I was training, doing a lot of cross training and other sports and being active. Right. And now that I'm older, I've lived my life longer now with my impairment than I have without. And so looking back, trying to remember, you know, how it's different, um, it's kind of a tricky thing. I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm, I'm more of an adult now. And so right. when I'm training, I'm very specific. I, a typical day on the snow will look at me getting up at six o'clock. I go to the gym, do a little warm up. I'll go to the snow. Uh, I'll get anywhere between, you know, five to 10 runs on a course. I'll come back down to the gym, recover, uh, get my necessary gear ready for the next day. And then that's kind of a repeat thing. During the off seasons, I really enjoy going to the gym early morning. I enjoy playing golf. I enjoy paddle boarding and hiking and being outside. So what is the, in terms of the Paralympics coming up this winter in 2022, what's the What's the route? When do you, do you have trials, Paralympic trials to get you there that you have to qualify at? So right now, in order to qualify for the 2022 games, I am not quite sure what our criteria is. However, yeah. as a national team athlete, I've been working really hard to maintain my ranking within the country and my status on the team. And so when those are announced, I'm very confident that I'll be able to perform in order to, to make the Paralympic team. Love it. Hey, Thomas, I want to thank you for taking so much time and for being such a great part of CAF. And also, best of luck at the, hopefully, the Paralympic Games coming up uh, in 2022. Thank you so much for having me. So lucky to be a part of CAF, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the future. I love it. Uh, uh, Thomas has been our guest. Again, my name is Bob Babbitt. This is CAF's Heroes of Sport. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time. See ya.